Fortunately for me, I guess, and maybe for a lot of investors out there, I still had decades left to invest. I really, as a, a Marine Corporal, doesn't get paid a whole lot. So I wasn't in, really investing that much. I didn't have a lot to lose when the market dropped out. But it did teach me a lesson. And it is frustrating when you start investing where and, and during a period when everything goes, goes up. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called The Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out, join the group, join the community, ask questions, and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page, and we have them in the video or podcast description below. Hey, welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni, and today's guest is Joseph Hogue from the highly viewed YouTube channel, Let's Talk Money. I, I just want to point something out real quick, that his channel was actually the first finance or investor related content that I started watching on YouTube ever. And it was something I talked with him the last time we tried to do this interview. Joseph, I really appreciate the flexibility and you coming back on to have this conversation. Thanks for joining us today. Mike, a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. I, I don't know whether me being the first YouTuber you, you ever watched is just a matter of me being an old timer and, and being around for a little bit or, or what, but, but that's cool. That's really fun to hear. Yeah, absolutely, man. It was before I even started my own personal finance journey when I was just looking up different things and I came across this dude with a bow tie on just <laughs> putting out this really good information. I'm like, oh man, this is this guy could listen to this. And then my wife came around the corner, she said, what you watching? I'm like, oh, this guy's pretty cool. Who in a bow tie, yeah. Yeah, and he's sitting here talking about the stock market and index funds and, and, and REITs and, and all the stuff I was interested in. So I was like, I, I think I'm going to hit subscribe. So yeah, subscribe to your channel. It's been absolutely awesome, man. I think after you, I started following like our rich journey and then mm -hmm. a couple others like uh, Graham Stephan and all that, but you were the first man. And I just wanted to point that out because uh, there was just something about your channel that stuck out to me. And I'm pretty sure it was the bow tie. Awesome. Well, great to have you in the community. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, the first question I'd like to ask you is the same question I ask everybody that comes on the show. Can you share a little bit about yourself, share your story? How did everything get started for you? So I want to talk about how you got started investing in the uh, stock market, how you got, got started with your YouTube channel. And then from what I understand, looking at your shadow box behind you there too, and you've talked about it before in your channel, but you were also, you also served in the Marines. So if you could rewind back as far as you want to go, but we'd like to know who Joseph Hogue is. Sure. Originally from Des Moines, Iowa, right there in the bed bat basket, born and raised, went into the Marine Corps, got out, you know, went to college, did the whole college thing. And just immediately you started working as a commercial real estate analyst and immediately fell in love with investing, right? That idea of putting your money to work in, instead of just putting it in a savings account and watching it grow, your money is going to grow for you. And you can actually own a piece of companies, right? You can own uh, Apple, you can own Google. And so I, I got pretty heavily into investing, worked worked as a venture capital analyst, set up a sell-side research department for a venture capital firm, worked in private wealth management, worked a, a lot of those equity analyst ideas or areas. I got my chartered financial analyst designation in 2011 and quickly realized that working as a, a professional analyst or venture capital analyst and in private wealth, you're only dealing with maybe the top 1% of, of you know wealth earners out there. Those are really the only ones that can afford those services a lot of times. So in 2014, decided to go off onto my own, start my own websites uh, to really you know connect out there with, with Main Street Invest. And uh, I, I guess I could back up a little bit even further. Uh, while I was in the Marine Corps, started investing in 1999, which I think is really proven uh, prescient right now because obviously 1999 was the best time to, to start investing because we all know what happened like a year after that. Now, now I, I can have that connection with a lot of people that have just started investing over the last couple of years. 
and uh, and are now seeing that same thing, seeing the market drop out of uh, of their stocks and out out of their investments. So have felt that pain and uh, really taken a lot of my my own personal investing journey uh, onto the. But going back to to the story, uh, I was uh, I, I started the blogs, really wanted to connect with Main Street investors out there, bring what I had learned in venture capital investing, uh, private wealth management to uh, to Main Street. Love doing the blogs, but there's always something missing there, right? With just writing, somebody reading reading a blog. So I started on YouTube in 2017, and the growth has just been exponential. Uh, it's great being able to connect on that face to face level with people out there. I'm growing the community to over 550,000. I uh, get about 1.5 million views uh, on the videos each month. And, and it's great to, to be able to connect with people and, and build that community that, that's a little bit closer than maybe somebody just reading a blog. Uh, so, so yeah, I you know, love being on YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because before I started this podcast, it's, I, I did the same thing. Like I started off as a blog and I was just sharing, Hey, this is what I'm doing in my own personal journey to beat debt, start investing and, you know, start building my wealth. And a buddy of mine approached me and said, Hey, I know you like talking. I know you like talking to people. I guess it's the New York in me. So he's like, why don't you start a podcast and, and just start talking to people, share, bring them on your show, share what they're doing, talk about what you're doing. And I'm like, yeah, maybe when I retire from the Navy, I'll do that. And he said, he's like, oh, just do it now. Even if you can only do one a month, I'm like, all right, fine. But if I'm going to do it, I want to release one episode a week. So that's what I committed to. And I've been doing it ever since. And it started off very slow and now the podcast is blossoming, not quite to the same level that your YouTube channel is, but I feel very good about it because I feel like I'm making an impact and a difference. And I want to touch on something that you said too, that, that I thought was impactful, how you changed your focus on working as an analyst, working with those top 1% group. And you wanted to reach out to the middle guy, to the middle class, or who we call the average Joes. And I really respect that you went off, you took a risk, went off on your own to start your own thing. And because you wanted to help impact, make a bigger impact to, to other people, to help them get started in the right direction. So sure. I just want to say, I definitely appreciate that, Joseph. So. Well, sure. And not to sell myself short, but it was a little bit for me too. I never really connected with that, that top 1%. That's not where I come from growing up fairly, not dirt poor, but on the, on, not on the wrong side of the track, but on the track itself, it was nice to get back to talking to people that I could connect with and I could relate to as well. So a little bit for me, because I just didn't fit in with that one, 1%. But, but yeah, it's been great being able to really help the regular Main Street investor rather than the people that really don't need the help anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Joseph. So I, I want to point something else out too that you talked about. Sure. You said that you started investing back in 99, right? So we know what happened in 2000, yeah. Y2K, the first apocalypse that we've all gone through in our lifetime, which absolutely nothing happened except for the stock market going crazy. What was that like for you? What kind, what kind of emotions and experience do you have? Like when you first got started, like you're in 1999 and then all of a sudden it's boom. What was that like for you? Sure. I think fortunately for me, I guess, and maybe for a lot of investors out there, I still had decades left to invest. I really, as a, a Marine Corporal, doesn't get paid a whole lot. So I wasn't in, really investing that much. I didn't have a lot to lose when the market dropped out, but it did teach me a lesson. And it is frustrating when you start investing where, and, and during a period when everything goes, goes up over the last couple of years, we have not seen more than a 5% dip in stocks more than maybe two or three times. And typically it happens at least two times a year. So I think a lot of investors like I was back in 1999 are brought up on the idea that stocks are only going up and you're going to be rich just by playing that momentum investing strategy. And, and momentum investing is great because it works until it doesn't, until the market really drops out and leaves those momentum stocks uh, behind. So it is so frustrating to to really have your worldview of this of stocks and investing challenged like that and really thrown out like that. You really start you go through all those levels of the what is it, the seven stages of grief, right? Where it's denial, then it's then it's fear, and then it's uh, blaming and bargaining and all that. And it really is something uh, something like that. Trying to figure out what happened and. Yeah, honestly, for a lot of us, for a lot of investors, it's just a learning experience that a lot of people have to go through. I've, I think, ten years as an equity analyst, the CFA chart cu curriculum, all that professional experience, and I think probably the biggest lessons that I've learned and that I share on the channel 
are the ones that I've learned just as a, a personal investor, just a, as, as an investor myself, those mistakes that I've made, like that momentum strategy, when to get out of that. Dollar cost averaging into a stock all the way down and losing a lot of money, things like that. You bring up some very great points here, and especially with the whole momentum investing. And this is something that we've seen in, in the past, uh, actually since the pandemic started, we've seen a lot of that because people like riding these trains and we saw what happened with the whole Reddit thing and Wall Street bets and all that. That was bonkers. And it made some people a lot of money. But at the same time, there's other people that got in at the end of the hype and they paid the price. Yeah. Uh, I was actually recently watching another YouTuber. I, I mentioned him before, Graham Stephan. He had a guest on his show, the, the Dogecoin Millionaire, and they were talking <laughs> about, he's, I'm holding it, I'm holding it. And he went from 3 million down to 300K, like in the past couple weeks. Something like that is, is very impactful. And sometimes you just got to know when to let go and, sure. and just be like, hey, I'm, I'm going to chalk this one up as a loss and move on. Sure. And sometimes well, you need to know like, when it is safe to hold, right? Yeah. And you can never really know. Uh, I think at any level, I used to have a, a actually a, a gunny in the Marine Corps that, that used to tell me, show me an income and I'll show you how to live above it. Any income, I'm sure that Dogecoin millionaire at $3 million, he was thinking, hell, if this thing keeps going, I, I'm at 10 million uh, before the end of the year, that kind of thing. And uh, never know exactly when to pull back on that kind of strategy. I will say one thing that, that I've found since making the mistakes myself uh, that is really helpful is when that momentum strategy really comes into uh, into vogue and comes back. And what we're talking about here is, you know, you're you're just basically just investing in the stocks that are going up, which is some people's entire investing strategy over the last three years. I, I got just so frustrated through the comments on the videos over the last couple of years, because uh, I would do a video, you know, analyzing a stock saying it's a good stock. And, and then all I would get in the comments was, oh, why not just invest in Tesla? It's always going up. And, you know, it does until it doesn't. And, right, and right. so that's that strategy, just investing in what has worked. And there's some technical analysis you can put behind it. Basically, it is just that. And it tends to work very well for periods. My, my experience was with it was in 2000. And so I believe it was uh, 2000. Yeah, 2005. I was I was working as a uh, working as an equity analyst, actually, I just started dabbling in that. And uh, it was playing uh, playing some momentum stocks on my own I had planned on going down to Louisiana. My mom had volunteered down there after Hurricane Katrina to try to rebuild everything. And I was going to visit her for Mother's Day. And over the three months before that, I was just, I was up like $38,000 on, on some momentum stocks, uh, just a handful of momentum stocks doing really well. And I remember because over that weekend, over over the uh, the four days that I was there, which included two, two market days, I lost I think something like $17,000, $17,000, of when that momentum strategy started breaking down. And yeah, you, there are no signs there. There's no warning ahead of it. What I will say since, since then, what I've learned to do is, yeah, you can buy those momentum stocks. You can invest in those, but periodically take some money out and put it in the rest of your portfolio, your long-term portfolio. So basically you're taking some profits off the table and it's up to you when you decide to do that. I would formalize it though in a written plan because otherwise you, if you just tell yourself you're going to do it every six months, you get to that six months and you're like, no, I want to let, the, let this ride. I want to keep going. So you formalize it right into a plan and say, okay, every three months, every six months, I'm going to go into the, my mo momentum stock, take some money off the table there, take some of those profits and put it into some of these long-term stocks, really lock in those profits basically. Uh, so, you know, when that momentum strategy fails, because it always does, what people are experiencing right now has been experienced multiple times over decades and decades of investing by myself and, and many others. It does happen. It, it History repeats. It just does. So, so that's something that, that I think a lot of momentum investors can take with them is taking some profits off the table periodically. Yes, it, it sucks to take those profits off and those momentum stocks keep on going, but it will lock them in. Whereas a lot of people are finding out over the last year that those profits have just evaporated. Yes, that's a great point. And it's exactly the, the direction I wanted to steer this conversation because I wanted to talk about what kind of investment strategy you have because you've experienced this several times and you've, especially with, with the whole momentum and, and with what happened in 2005 with Katrina, right? You got to feel that pain firsthand with an immediate hit to your profits just over a four-day weekend with only two of them being trading days. So that's absolutely 
bonkers. So you lost what half your profits in, in a two day period, really. When you're looking at stuff like that, there's, there's different ways that you can invest it, whether it's the momentum that you were talking about before, but then there's also ways that are a little bit safer, but you're also still getting really good gains and you're still getting, you're still attacking with compound interest, right? You're still able to build your wealth and do things that way. And one of the ways that I, I see you talk about on your channel too, and one of the things I really enjoy about what you talk about is you actually sit down and you'll analyze, you'll go through, hey, here's the 10 uh, best REITs for you to invest in this year. Here's the top five index funds you should be looking at this year, and here's why. And you break it down and you make it easier for the viewer to understand why it is that you're picking these funds or REITs or even sometimes individual stocks. And I've seen a couple of those as well. So what is the quarter set the, the core satellite investment strategy and why do you like it so much? Sure. First, I want to tell you a dirty little secret of YouTube and blogging and probably podcasting too. A lot of these, the influencer based, the content based uh, investing kind of things and CNBC and TV as well. We need to get people to come back to the videos or the podcasts and that we have to, at times, as bad as it seems, sensationalize investing. Give them those listicles, the seven best growth stocks to buy right now. The attention and, grabber. Yeah, it's just a game that, that you have to play to be able to get people to your message. Within that message, what I like to do is kind of trick people almost and give them that why you're doing this and how you're doing this. So when uh, my videos aren't so much that seven best stocks to buy right now, that's that's the hook. Uh, the, the, the message that I want to get across to people is in each video, how are you doing this? Why are you doing this? To make you a better investor so you can really basically take that knowledge and, uh, and go with it on your own when you're able to. So that's one thing. So just to understand whenever you're watching uh, YouTube, CNBC, internet, whatever you're watching uh, with investing, try to find the why and the how of, uh, of investing rather than just the easy, okay, what stocks should I pick right now? That's probably one of the best pieces of, of advice I can give people as far as learning how to invest. Uh, the core satellite strategy though, yeah, you know, my probably my favorite strategy because it is so simple. It is it takes so much stress out of investing and it's really one of the core, one of the, one of the basic ideas of investing. Within this, okay, you've got your overall portfolio, your net wealth, right? And you break that down into maybe 50% of your money, 50, 60, even as high as I've seen, even high as 65, 75% of your money. And you have in just a very core group of, of ETFs, of funds, right? And those are very diversified. They're across different asset classes. So you maybe you have some stock funds, some bond funds, some real estate funds, uh, things like that. And what that's doing is it's giving you the uh, just those broad market returns in those asset classes, right? So you're diversified across different assets, stocks, bonds, real estate, uh, maybe even some some commodities and things in there. And, and within some of those, maybe within the stock funds, that's diversified across dividend stocks, growth stocks, things like that. So the majority of your portfolio is very much diversified uh, and, and very much just market returns, just uh, slow and steady wins the race, right? Now with the, the remaining portion of your portfolio and with that core part of your portfolio, with mine anyway, there's sometimes months I'll go without even looking at some of those ETFs because I know there are so many stocks in there. There are so many bonds and, and different investments that news about any one company isn't going to affect the, uh, the ETF very much. It isn't going to crush an ETF, right? Uh, those ETFs, those funds are just giving me those market returns and, and I don't really have to worry about them. On the other part of your portfolio, that 35%, that's where you start. That's where you can invest in individual stocks. And uh, and you can even separate that into different parts. I've got some stocks that are my long-term, stress-free, buy-and-hold forever stocks that I hold. And then I do have a portion of my portfolio that kind of scratches that itch. We, we talk about uh, trading and momentum strategy and some of the momentum stocks that you don't necessarily want to hold forever, but you really like the story right now and, and, and you think they're, they're going up and you're going to make a lot of money. It's not something you want to put a lot of money in from your portfolio in. Having that maybe 5 or 10% of your wealth or of your portfolio in those types of investments that you can play around with, you have fun with, that is going to free you from doing that kind of trading and that kind of investing and, and, and stock picking with your entire portfolio and ruining it, right? Because if you're in this core part of your portfolio with those ETFs or those long-term stocks that you want to hold forever, if you're in there trying to satisfy that itch of uh, stock analysis and stock picking by buying and selling those all the time, you're just going to wreck your portfolio and you're going to wreck those long-term returns, right? So 
I've got maybe that five or 10% of my money in those stock trade, trading ideas, the shorter term ideas that I really enjoy doing and uh, keeps my hands off the other part of the portfolio. In this other part though, so maybe 20%, 25% of your portfolio, you've got those long term, those long term stocks, those stocks that you think can do a little bit better than the market returns, can do a little bit better than some of these ETFs and, and their industry, right? Those are your best of breed companies, your companies that are really changing the way we live. And you think they're going to be uh, the, the next Amazon or the next, uh, the next Apple or or something like that. And what this does is with that core part of your portfolio, you're getting the market returns. You're getting a stress-free, really hands-off part of investing that, that has really proven to, to do very well. With the, the satellite portion, maybe you have two or 3% in each stock. So you really only have 10 or 15 stocks that you really believe in. One, this just, it frees up a lot of time, right? You don't have to look for the, that next hot stock all the time. You're not looking for 50 stocks to fill your portfolio. You've only got space for maybe 10 or 15 stocks. So you can really do the analysis. You can really get behind these stocks and, and just keep investing in those. You don't have to add new stocks all the time. So it really reduces the time necessary to actually analyze stocks and follow stocks and things like that. Plus it gives you a little bit of discipline. If you're only investing in maybe 15 individual stocks within that part of your portfolio, Portfolio, then you, they better be the best ones out there. They're the ones that you believe in the very most. You're not wishy-washy on them because because you've put the time in and, and those are really your best of breed picks. Those are all fantastic points, Joseph. Definitely appreciate that. And I'm going to point something out too that you had mentioned. the For that momentum, right? You said maybe five to 10% is what you're going to use towards those. But And they should be companies or stocks that you believe in, that you, sure. you truly believe are going to grow for whatever reason it is that you believe that they're going to grow. Now, I, I wanted to ask you, so as you're going through all this, let's say your momentum stocks are just out there crushing it. Let's say you got in early on Tesla and that 5% of your wealth that you invested into Tesla has now become 15% of your wealth because of how well it did. When would you decide to rebalance or kind of shift some of those funds around to get that back down to the five to 10%? Area? Great question. Yeah, great question. I, and, and I would use it as a percentage of your wealth kind of idea. I, I generally tell people or recommend that uh, you don't have more than 10% of your wealth in any one individual stock because face it, uh, there, there are the in runs out there. They are there are the companies that you know have committed fraud, the Wells Fargo's, things like that. Uh, but there's also a sense that bad things happen to good companies as well. It can be a great company, and one person at the top can can set a cor corporate culture of fraud or do something. So you never want one stock to really be that that decider on your portfolio. If you lose 10% of your portfolio, it's very hard to come back from that. Be able to make make up the returns in the rest of your stocks. If you may if you lose 2 or 3% of your portfolio, eh, it sucks, but it, it's still it's not something that that is going to destroy uh, your returns for years to come. So I would have no more I would generally have no more than 3 to 5% of my money in any one individual stock. If it is growing, if I am going to let it run, then generally when it does get to that 10% level, then I start seriously looking at cutting it back to 5% and and putting that basically like we talked about with those growth stocks, locking that profit in by putting it in some of those longer term picks. That's fantastic points. And just getting to the point where you get to look at your portfolios, sit back and just rebalance and say, all right, I, I made this much. This has been great, fantastic returns. I'm now going to take some of my profits out and invest it into those ETFs and index funds that are more comfortable and that are steady. Sure. So that's a great point. Yeah. A, a yeah. lot of people, a lot of people will reply to that, uh, especially, okay, with, with that example of Tesla, a lot of people will, will reply, uh, well, yeah, but if I had taken half of my Tesla stake out and locked in those profits, put them in something else over the last couple of years, I would still, I would have missed out on a lot of upside. And, and that's the risk you face, but, but you never know where at on that upside you are. Tesla itself has given us many opportunities, many tops over the last just five years, really. Just look at all the top, all the peaks where it has then fallen 20 or 30%. So you never really know where you're at in that cycle for that stock. And I would just feel much more comfortable with, yeah, taking those profits out Okay, every once in a while, infrequently, and then waiting for that opportunity. That's not to say that if if it doesn't fall 20 or 30% that you can't 
take some of that money back out that you put in those long-term stocks and put it put it in there to to really ride it up again. Yeah, Joseph, that's a great point. And I think this comes down to the that key word that you mentioned earlier, and that's where you can discipline yourself. And that's where the discipline is going to come in because you could sit here and say, oh, it's it's just, I pulled some of those, my profits out of Tesla and then it just kept going up and going up. You, you got to get rid of the FOMO and you got to yeah, discipline yourself. Because yeah. I, I did this myself. I there, there was one particular stock that I invested in that I said, okay, this is great. They had acquired three other companies. They were a power company, a battery company. They acquired three other companies. The stock price doubled. I said, oh man, I doubled my money. I sold it all, took all the profits. What I should have done is sold, got it back down to what I initially invested because it 25X oh, over the next three months. Wow. And uh, if I would painful. have just left it alone yeah. and it was only a, a $2,000 investment. No, sorry, a $4,000 investment. I doubled it to eight thousand dollars. If I would have just left it alone, it would have been five hundred thousand dollars. If I would wow. have just taken my profits out and left it alone, it would have been two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So it's the little things like that where I was, and, and this is when I was really new into this, and I wasn't really like paying attention to things like that, and I didn't have that good core discipline uh, going on. And it's one of those things that I, I look back at and I just go, ah. But I was like, you know what? I can't sit here and live with regrets, not even a single letter. Doing that, you start making these bad decisions. That hindsight gets everybody. It is something that everybody goes through. Everybody's got a story like that. But then, and you tend to remember those stories because of course they affect you so much. And what you could have had, what you could have made. But then you don't necessarily remember the stories where, yeah, you did get out of a stock. You stopped watching it. Uh, and you don't really realize that stock then dropped 30 or 40 or 50% because you really, you stopped watching watching it, things like that. So you were, where you did make that, that very good timely decision. And I think it just comes down to, 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 yeah, that moderation, not necessarily selling all of the stock, but just selling it back, locking in some of those profits, letting some of them run and, and having that discipline. Yeah. I think one thing, I think one of the biggest lessons I'd like to be able to teach people is how to have that discipline without the pain because military guys like us we know discipline comes from pain you learn that discipline from from your from the pain of training and from the pain of, of your mistakes and it's it's the same with investing but it doesn't have to be uh, there there has got to be a way that we can teach investors that discipline of what to do and you know how to do it in the process without them having to basically commit the same mistakes that we we ourselves made yeah, that's a great point. And and going along the lines here, talking about discipline, right? Now, hey, I could look back at that and say, you know what? Hey, I made 100% profit. I doubled my yeah, money. Yeah. But hey, I'm, I'm cool with that. But at the same time, just looking at the, the bigger picture when it comes to discipline itself, especially with the market right now with how it is, it's been very volatile. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of people just trying to say, ah, the world's ending and this and that, the, the, their hair's on fire. Or for guys like you and me, they get burn marks on the top of their head here because the hair's already burned off. It happens. <laughs> so that's why I wear a hat, man. So when you see you're in these situations, like you've been through this a couple times, right? In, in the nine, you know, late nineties, yeah. early two thousands. And then also, you know, 2008 timeframe. And now with what's happening, how do you stay calm when you see such big drops or big fluctuations in the stock market? What is it that keeps you comfortable with your portfolio? You know, Mike, uh, not to sound callous and I hate I hate saying this, but I kind of don't, right? Kind of was it hashtag not really or, or whatever it is, because because I know there are people out there that that are losing a lot of money that, and especially the ones that are so close to retirement that that don't have that time to to build that money back. But staying calm, I'm loving it. I, it just completely blows my mind that people love to invest, love to push as much money as possible into stocks as the market is going up. But then they panic and freak out when the market starts coming down and they stop and this is the best time to invest. The market is giving you discounts on stock prices. And that's not saying that the market isn't going to continue to go down or that you should push all your money in right now, because I think having a formal strategy of when you're going to invest and how you're going to invest really, really optimizes it. But, but yeah. If you look at any stock chart over the last 50, 100 years, whatever, the only thing that is 100% guaranteed is that the stocks will rise again. They will reach a new peak sometime in the future, right? And a lot of times it's not that long. Bear markets average uh, since 19, 1956. We've gone through 12, uh, 12 bear markets, so 20% or more down from the peak. Uh, and it's only averaged nine months. 
right? Even some of the longer ones, maybe 18 months. That's only a year and a half compared to the bull market that's averaged about 54 months. But the best time to, to invest uh, is now when, when stocks are discounted because you're getting them at better prices than they were a year ago. And those stocks are going to produce those returns, right? We, uh, a year or two ago, all the big bulge bracket banks, JP Morgan, Stanley, Goldman Sachs, they were all screaming about how uh, stocks were so expensive that it was likely that we were only going to get a 4% annualized return over the next 10 years. Now stocks are coming down so much that you do have the opportunity to get those 10 and 12% annualized returns now because you're buying at a lower level. Yeah, I would just say, do not panic. Don't get panicked out of this market. Don't push all your money in right away. Uh, and we can talk about a strategy for that, but, uh, but just realize that this is the best time to invest. That's a fantastic point. I, I, it makes me think back to, to March of 2020. We <laughs> see how long that lasted, a month. <laughs> And then the, 23 stock, days. then the stock market just skyrocketed. It was absolutely bonkers. We, we went from the pandemic starting and everyone, everyone saying, oh, this is it. And, and home prices, everything was selling cheap. Everything was on sale. And then, like you said, 23 days later, everything skyrocketed. Not only the stock market, but the housing market, just everything just jumped huge. That's an, another thing, like you said, the, the whole discipline thing. So actually, I, I want to get into that a little bit because you had mentioned different strategies like when you see these dips in the stock market. So if we could talk about that, and, and I think I know where you're going to go with this, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on for somebody that's getting you know ready to start investing in the stock market today with everything that's going on, what's a good way for them to invest right now with the market as volatile as it is? Sure. Whether it's someone uh, that's just started investing or has been investing, I think just having a formalized strategy of when you're going to buy into stocks is really helpful. And what that means is basically you look at something like the S&P 500 index, which is at $3,900 or 3,900 right now. It was at 4818 at the top. So it's right about 19% down from the peak. Now we know that bear markets have averaged 28% 20, 20, down from the peak in the past. Ones they're followed by a recession a little bit more. So 30 to 35, we know that the last two recessions uh, in 2008 and, and then 2000, or the last two big bear markets were down like 50%. So if you just take that into perspective, okay, so what I want to do is I want to set markers on the S&P 500 and say, okay, you know what? I'm going to invest a little bit now because the market's already down almost 20%. Uh, I want to put some of, my, some of my money to work, but I want to save some of it back. Uh, so when the S&P 500 gets down to, you say 3,500, which I think would be something like uh, 20, 27%, maybe 3,400, I think is, is 27, 28% uh, down from the peak. So that would be that bear market average. Then I'm going to invest maybe a third of my cash. And, and you're not investing in the market itself, that, that index, but you're investing in the stocks that you really love, uh, those long-term stocks stocks that you want to buy. You're just using the, the index as a marker, but you're in, you're taking maybe a third of your cash, putting it in those stocks that you love. Uh, then you're going to wait. You're going to wait if the market comes down to maybe 2,900, which I, I think would be something like 40% or, or so, uh, maybe 35 from the peak. Then you're going to invest another third of your cash. And what this does is it doesn't say that you're trying to time the market and find that, that, that low, that very trough in the market but you're just putting your money to work at different intervals here. So one, you have money uh, working for you, right? Right. Just in case the market does start rebounding into that new next bull market, because like you said, 2000 or 2020, all those, when the bear market does end and when stocks do start rebounding, they rebound fast, right? So you want your money working for you, but you don't want necessarily want to push all your money in just in case it keeps on falling, right? So you do have money working for you. You've got cash set aside uh, to be able to take advantage of those lower prices later on. Uh, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. What it also does is uh, probably more important though. It keeps people from being their own worst enemies and keeps them from basically tearing their hair out uh, or, or having it go great for our, our, on our perspective. Because a lot of investors, they'll watch the market every single day uh, wondering, should I invest now? Is this it? Is this low? Uh, and they'll just panic and basically push all their money in and they'll be cash all in within a week or two uh, because they just can't take the stress. What this kind of a formal strategy does is it takes that stress out because you've got a plan and you're going to follow it, right? You don't have to work, watch the market every day. You just watch to see if the S&P has hit those levels where you're going to start investing as part of that money. So it's a great strategy and it takes the stress out, takes, takes the guesswork out of investing and then gives you that opportunity to invest a little bit now 
and then at different periods to, to take advantage of those prices. Joseph, those are fantastic points, especially when you talk about just taking away the stress. Because I, I think that's probably one of the biggest things, especially for the people that listen to my show that they finally got themselves out of consumer debt and they started investing and they're like, hey, I want to go all in on something. I'm scared. I'm nervous. You don't have to go all in on something. Why don't you, like Joseph said, one third and just, and then wait a little bit, then another one third and just keep it like that. So you've got cash reserves just in case. And at the same time, you're putting your money to work because we sure. all know keeping your money in your savings account, it's it's not yeah. doing anything, especially with inflation the way it is right now. Yeah. Advertise, we're seeing it over 8%, but we know it's really more than that. So if you're not getting at least an 8% return, you're losing money. And I'd, and I'd add to that. A lot of people are saying, yeah, that, that sounds great, but I'm already all in or, or I don't have any much money to invest. I, another thing I would suggest is just realize, okay, uh, what kind of an opportunity this is to invest in stocks at these discount prices and as stocks fall further. Uh, now is the time to look at some of those, some of those side hustles or some of those passive income ideas or anything, call it a part-time job if you want, but just commit yourself to even three months, you know, three months, uh, save up an extra $3,000 or so really, really put your nose to the grindstone and save up that money because you do have those up op that opportunity. Uh, doesn't mean you have to take on a part-time job. Doesn't mean you have to do this for more than a few months, uh, but do it now, save up that money and be able to take advantage of these prices. Even if you are, are already in all cash, cash in your already uh, all invested in your portfolio or you don't have any cash to invest, I'd say take that opportunity right now to start investing. Because again, when the market sells off, like this is the time you make money. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to touch on something that you just brought up. And this was actually something I wanted to, to discuss with you as well, was you had mentioned side hustles and building up other passive income. And so there's different ways to do that. I know you did it through your blog, right? You also wrote some books and, and you had some book sales and everything. And now you've got your YouTube channel, which provides a nice little uh, side income as well. So what you know, for somebody, uh, again, that's looking to start investing and they, they don't just quite have the money to do it from their nine to five and they're living paycheck to paycheck. What, what would you say are some good side hustles they could explore to try to start building a side income to, to take that money and invest? Sure. There's a lot of things uh, I would say some of the most obvious like blogging, YouTube, a lot of those, it, it, it can take quite a while to actually start making uh, start making money on that. And, and, this instance or in this example, you would want something where you can start making money pretty well immediately. So it's probably going to have to be a little bit more on the traditional side of working for an hourly wage, something like that. Now I will say you can do just about anything online these days. So think of things, typical traditional jobs that, that you would do, except you know how to do them online. So you could try that. Another one, and probably the, the one that worked fastest for me was that self-publishing idea. And everybody says, I don't know how to write. I don't know what I would write about. Everyone has a book in them. Okay. Anything you do on a daily basis, you're an expert in that. And people want to know about it, whether it's underwater basket weaving, there are actually courses, video courses online about underwater basket weaving and they get sales. So don't say that you don't know that people wouldn't don't want to know what you know, right? Now, what's more important here, I think is especially with self-publishing and the power of self-publishing really is that you can put a book together in two or three months, put it on the world's largest e-commerce platform on Amazon that already gets billions of views a month. If you start your own blog, you start your own YouTube channel, you're going to hear cricket chirping for the better part of uh, six months, but you get your, you publish self-publish your book on Amazon and you got immediately set immediate sales, right? I was making within the first six months, I, I had two books out on Amazon. I was making with uh, $500 a month within the first six months. And, and so it's a very fast income generator that you can do. One thing I, I would say about what to write about, and how to do that. Focus on it's more important your own personal journey and sharing that than it is actually what you're teaching somebody to do, right? Because, because uh, yeah, the internet's free. People can go to the internet and learn how to do something within 30 minutes. But what they buy your books for, what they buy those uh, books on Amazon for is that personal journey and someone they can relate to, relate to their story, how they did it and make that story their own. So really pick something that you're passionate about talking about, maybe have a little bit of expertise in that that, that you've done for, for a while, a hobby or something and, and write about that and share your own personal story in that. A great way to, to yeah, really quickly start making money. Uh, so that's one, one example. Uh, there's a whole lot of, a lot of examples out there. Just because there, there are, like you said, I see a lot of people that even do, they start uh, on Upwork or Fiverr. They just start doing like little side gigs. Yeah. 
things like that. If you are good at writing, you can write blog posts for other blogs and have them pay you. I've seen a lot social of people media. do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Social media poster. You, I mean, yeah, I have a social media yeah. manager that I pay. That takes See? care of my stuff for me. And, and it's fantastic. And I found them on Upwork. And it's, it's something that you can do as a side hustle, being a virtual assistant, little things like that. But mm -hmm. I really like what you did with the self-publishing. And one of these days, I'm going to get off my butt and write myself <laughs> a book as well and, and and try that out for myself. But that's awesome stuff, man. And we're not talking yeah. about, we're not again, we're not talking about a, a part-time job another another nine to five or something here okay we're talking maybe five hours a week uh 10 hours a week at most really just just take the opportunity that you've got right now to make that extra money over the next three or six months uh to be able to invest that because again that money is going to multiply many times many times over as the stock market does eventually rebound and hit those new highs that's the beauty of compound interest it's the reason why it's the eighth wonder of the world and if you're investing in dividend uh stocks that's another passive income right there as well that you're sure. going to get paid Paid quarterly or monthly or annually, depending on what it is. That's make some extra money and employ that money to work for you so you can work less in the future. That's the way it is. Do the hard work now so you can take a break and rest uh, a little bit in the future. And the thing is, you don't, everybody has it in their head too, like most Americans do, that you have to work and you have to wait until you're in your 60s to retire. And you really, you really don't. You can, if you put in the hard work for a good five to 10 years, you can retire at a very young age. And I've seen so many people do it. Uh, that it's the, the whole thing behind the fire movement and things like that. Now, I, I tend to stay away from the, the RE part of uh, fire. I like the financial independence part. The retire early, that's great. I, I'm 38 well, you know, and I'm hitting financial independence this year and I don't, I want to keep going. That's one thing. I, I think fire is overrated, honestly, because people get to retire. People hey, get to on, retirement. I'm wearing the shirt. I'm wearing the shirt. People get to retirement, whether they're 38 or whether they're 68. And then they're sitting there in their underwear on their lazy boy every day thinking, what the hell do I do now? There's only so much prices, right? You can watch. Okay. So you've True. got it. Uh, I think happiness is finding something that you enjoy doing and, and that somebody's going to pay you to, to do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's going to seem like a job every once in a while, but you're still going to have that passion for it. And uh, yeah, focus on finding what you enjoy doing, what you could see yourself doing until they put you in the ground and you don't even worry about retirement. Yeah. Build that up slowly. Okay. Uh, you, you can do, you do your nine to five, you do the side hustles, whatever you want to do uh, in the meantime, but spend a few hours every week just thinking about that passion project that you want to do. I really want to create that mastery in that and start getting paid for it because then you don't even worry about it. Then you won't even have to worry about the money. Yeah. Can you really consider it work if it's something you enjoy doing? I, I talk exactly. about that all the time on this podcast. And that's why I'm looking. I love real estate. I love investing in real estate. And when I retire from the Navy, I'm going to continue doing that in my podcast. And that's what I'm going to do because that's exactly. my passion. And I'm going to continue doing that and continuing helping other people also as a financial coach. So it's little things like that you get this passion about and you get fired up about. And hey, if you can make some money while doing it, that's even better. Okay. I want to kind of transition this because uh, we're running out of time here into something that we do called the final round. It's where we okay. ask the same four questions to everyone that comes on the show. We touched on one already, but we're, we're going to maybe go, get a little more specific with that as well. But if you're ready to go, we'll get this party started. Sure. Okay. Let's go. All right. So the first question of the final round is what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Biggest mistake. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come off investing here because I, I think probably the biggest mistake I've made taught me taught me so much. It was really there was in 2000 and 2003 2004 I was doing very well in real estate. Of course, naturally everyone was doing really well in real estate. Buying I was buying fixer uppers, right, fixing them up and then renting them out, and then I would I would cash refinance them. You know, so take money out after fixing them back up put that into buying more. So I had seven real estate properties in my early twenties uh, and I was managing those while, while going to school and while working full time. And so the cash flow was there. And what did I do? I went out and bought a $40,000 new shiny red convertible Porsche Boxster. Always, always wanted the car, always thought they, they looked really awesome and thought it would make me look so great. And, and what well, it, it really didn't. It turned some heads. It, it did attract some people, but it was the wrong type of people. And, and it did teach me a, a lot of things about materialism and lifestyle creep. One thing, I think those things that you buy, especially the very expensive things, they don't really measurably add to your life. But more importantly, that idea of lifestyle creep, where as you start making more money, uh, then somehow ma magically, mysteriously, 
your expenses start going up to meet that level. I have doctor friends, lawyer friends, and, and such making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that can't save a dime. <laughs> they can't seem to save, save, save enough to invest. Can't even max out their IRA or their, their retirement contributions because they just don't have the money. Their expenses have gone up every year that they've been making money. And these are the same people that lived just fine on their internist, internist salary of, of 20 or $30,000 a, a year. So really watch that lifestyle creep on those expenses. If it's something, if you can attack that and live a little, enjoy life, but not let those expenses go up as much as your income every single year, you can really get to a point where you are saving a lot of money. If you're doing some of these side hustles or if you're starting your own online business and your income is going up 10, 20% a year, and that is possible, uh, especially with a, a business and your expenses are only going up maybe two or three or 5% a year, you get to a point where you're saving 50% of your money, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and you're making, you're basically pit punching your ticket. You can do whatever you want for the rest of your life. So really watch that that lifestyle creep because I, I learned the hard way that those expenses, again, tend to match, tend to rise to match your income if you let it. Fantastic point, Joseph. And I, I wrote that one down too, because you hear that a lot. The lifestyle creep is something that, that happens to a lot of people when you start making more money, you know, more money, more problems. That's how it goes. And you have lifestyle creep on top of this inflation creep that we have going on right now. And it could really put you in a tough spot. So that's a great point and definitely glad you learned from that with the Porsches. Our next question, this is going to tie into that. These kind of all tie into each other. And what is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started? Okay. All right. That's probably going to tie into what we were talking about previously, where limits, position limits on your stocks. So this is 2000 and uh, I want to say, I want to say 2014, uh, something like that, 2012, maybe 2013, 2014. And uh, if you, you know, rewind all the way back there, the, uh, the coal stocks, right? The coal uh, miners and, and that were just getting absolutely crushed. Energy prices were coming down. A lot of these fossil fuel uh, prices were coming down and all the coal miners were just getting crushed. But I looked at it and I was like, okay, we are still using coal for like about 40% of our electricity generation. We're not going to wean ourselves off of this thing in a year. And th these miners are rock bottom prices. I picked the, the most stable of the breed, the largest with the market exposure, which was Peabody Energy, P ticker BTU at the time. And, and started investing in that. I figured, hey, eventually this has got to rebound. These are at fire sale prices and, and that's where I want to be buying, right? Buying when other people are selling, when there's blood in the streets. So I start buying and, and it keeps going down. And what the most investors reaction was what I did and uh, you dollar cost average down, right? If you buy it at hundred, it drops down to 80, then uh, you need it to go up 25% to get back to hundred, right? If you buy again and your cost, your average cost comes down to 90, then you only need it to come up you know what, 12%, right? To, uh, to, to break even and start making a profit. So I started dollar cost averaging down and, uh, and kept on dollar cost averaging down, kept on investing until this was something like 20, 30% of my portfolio, this one stock. And of course, eventually Peabody Energy did file bankruptcy uh, and, and the shareholders were wiped out. And I, I lost upwards of about $30,000 on that one. And, and it's taught me so many lessons. One is that, okay, dollar cost averaging is fine. Even on the way up, everyone wants to buy buy more of their stock on the way down, but you just buy it on, if you if it's a stock you love and a stock you're gonna hold for, for decades, buy it anytime every few months. But but dollar cost averaging down is fine, but with those position limits in, in mind, okay? Because again, bad things happen to good companies. Companies do file bankruptcy and survive. A lot of people investing in the airlines right now, there will always be an American Airlines. There will always be uh, Southwest or, or Delta or things like that. But what they don't realize is a lot of these companies, uh, American Airlines in particular, has filed bankruptcy before. And there is still an American Airlines. There will still be an American Airlines. You're right. But there may not be those shareholders sticking around. So understand that companies can go away through bankruptcy and uh, and you really do have to watch that debt load. But the bigger picture here is just never to have more than about 10% of your money in that stock, okay? Your dollar cost averaging down, you're buying more, hoping to take advantage of those dips, but you've got to cut it off at, at some point. If a stock is 10% of your portfolio, you got to say, okay, you know, that what well, that's enough. 
I've averaged down. If it does rebound, then that's what I'm hoping for. That's great. But if it keeps on falling, I cannot commit any more money to this stock. So it really taught me a lot about that, as well as what to watch for in some of these falling knife stocks, these value stocks, right? That's definitely a great lesson learned for sure. That kind of really like uh, between that and the biggest mistake you've ever made, man, that's some really good lessons learned <laughs> that you've had over your lifetime of investing. It's the, the biggest lessons are, are always the ones from pain, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, and again, we be, both being in the military, we understand that wholeheartedly. Okay. So the next question is, and we touched on this a bit already. So if you want to get a little more specific, you can, but do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just getting started today? So let's say somebody who just paid off their consumer debt. They just got themselves to a good spot where they don't have credit card debt anymore and they want to start investing and start building their wealth. What kind of tips would you recommend to them? Sure. We could go back over all the things we talked about, like realizing that a bear market is the best time to invest, uh, ways, strategies to invest. I think one of the, mo the most important ideas though, is really one of the most basic is to understand that investing is just as much about, you know, that consistency and that habit of investing as it is about the returns and when you invest and how you invest and all that. Just building that habit of every month, taking a part of your paycheck, putting in an investment account, even if you're, you're not, you're just sitting it in cash, you know, waiting to invest in stocks or bonds or whatever you do in that account, but just have the habit of just moving some money from savings from your check into your investing account every month because so many people they try to uh, they try to do it manually or they'll say okay you know what I, I really don't have the money this month but i'm going to do double next month and then of course they don't have the money next month either uh, it is so important just to build that habit of moving that money but because like you say compounding it will grow i think i saw a statistic that warren buffett has made more money in the last since he's turned 65 so it's about 15 years more money in the last 15 years just on compounding than he did in the entire previous 50 years uh, of investing you know, started investing in something like when he was 14 made more money just in the past 15 years just because if you're making 10 percent off of 60 billion dollars that's six billion dollars a year you're making right so you get to a point where the, all that money that that habit that you built up over the years investing every month adds up and now the money you're making on that every year is just phenomenal yeah, it gets to the point where you can't even spend what you're making on compound <laughs> interest, even if you tried your hardest. No, that's fantastic. Yeah, awesome, awesome. All right, so one more question for the final round. And I'm going to ask this based off of, so besides your own, do you have a favorite business investing or real estate related book or podcast or both? Sure. Okay, so I'd have to say probably a book. And it's only because I am such a history nerd. And when my love of history and my passion for investing and, and that kind of thing kind of meet, it's, it's really the perfect combination. So I, I found a book, it's called uh, The History of the United States in Five Stock Market Crashes. It's written by uh, Scott Nations. He's a contributor there on uh, CNBC. And he really goes over uh, five of the biggest stock market crashes. I think he starts with 1907, the 19, uh, 1929, of course, 2000. Eight he covers, he covers like 1989, uh, and then one other one, the, the dot-com uh, bubble. And, and he really paints an inclusive entire picture on each one of these. And it's just, it's a great story. If you do dig in a little bit deeper and really think about it, think about it thoughtfully, then you can find commonalities and it can teach you a lot about investing. But just reading it, just, just for the story alone, is just amazing because you'll read things in there that are just crazy, especially the 19, the 1907 and the 1929 crash leading up to those. He covers, generally covers about 10 years leading up to the crash and then causes and that kind of thing. And it's just amazing how the markets worked back then. Some of the things people were doing, insider trading, a lot of things that are illegal now were just commonplace back then. It's just a great story to, to read. So that's a history of the United States in five stock market crashes. Awesome. Yeah. I wrote that one down. That's Definitely for, for you, that scratches a couple itches so yeah, yeah. for your history and also your investing itch there. Awesome. All right. So that's it for the final round, but I do have one more question for you, Joseph, and this is probably the most important question of all. And for the people that have been listening to this episode, they're like, oh my goodness, I, I really like what Joseph is putting out. I already follow his YouTube channel because he's awesome. I'm a Bowtie Nation member. Where can people find more information about you? Can you share your website, social media, all that? Yeah, I love to, love to see people in the community there on YouTube. So that's a given, but I've also got the, the blog, mystockmarketbasics.com. Uh, and that's really where I, I'm sharing a lot of the, just 
what just what it says the style the basics of the stock market you know don't overcomplicate investing uh, because there's so much there that can be so easy and so stress-free uh, so i really try sharing that on the blog we've got a weekly newsletter absolutely free goes out sunday night really just the, what i'm watching in the markets that week stocks i'm watching things like that uh, so if you go to pretty much any of the videos on the youtube channel within the description you'll find a link to that to that weekly newsletter uh, you'll also find the uh, the private within the newsletter i've got a link to the private facebook group which is the let's talk money a group there on Facebook. Again, just a great community to, to be in, to learn but, and, and talk back and forth with other investors. Fantastic. So Joseph, I'm going to make sure I have all those links in the show notes to make it easier for everybody so they can just click away or copy and paste. Hopefully they're not trying to do that while they're driving. And uh, yeah, so this has been absolutely phenomenal. I had uh, such a blast talking with you. This is like a dream interview for me because <laughs> I've been following your content for a while. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me and with your flexibility with, with how much we've had to change the interview time with recent events that, that I've had going on. So no I problem. definitely want to these, say- These I'm last couple of years gracious. have been crazy. Yeah. Sure. But hey, Joseph, absolute pleasure. Wishing you the best. And I, I know you've got a lot going on your end. We talked about it off camera. I know right now you're doing the expat thing and, and moving back to the States. So I'm really excited for you with your next move and really hope to see some more amazing things coming out of your channel. So I just want to say uh, again, thank you and aloha from Hawaii. Mike's my pleasure. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. Mm -hmm.